just want to make sure everyone can hear me. I'm yes, I can hear you. Okay. All right. Very good. I want to welcome everyone tonight. My name is Paul Robeson Ford. I'm a senior pastor of First Baptist Church, Highland Avenue here in Winston-Salem. also chair of the Board of Action for Equity, which is the main sponsor of tonight's forum. We're a Black-led, intentionally multiracial organization that is dedicated to closing the achievement gap and ensuring equitable access for all of our kids who are in education, quality one across the state of North Carolina. It's a real privilege uh, to be able to bring everybody here together tonight, even virtually under these inclement weather circumstances. We thank everybody uh, for being flexible and being available um, as we've made the last minute adaptations. I want to thank our executive director, Kelly B. Easton, our vice president, Kate Sano Lee, and all of the others, uh, Melissa Wick Glover, and others who have been a part of helping uh, this last hour to put everything together so that we can still carry on this important uh, conversation. So welcome again, especially to all of our North Carolina State Superintendent candidates uh, who have joined into this conversation tonight. To those of you uh, who are listening in uh, online uh, to see what is uh, going to be discussed tonight, we thank you for joining. And we do have links to this online, and so we invite others uh, to come on in. I want to bring up uh, Chris Nordstrom if, uh, if you're here um, to uh, provide a very important presentation about a very important case uh, that has a great deal of implications uh, for this work of educational equity here in North Carolina. Thank you, Reverend Ford. Um, I'm just going to go through a real brief uh, about a 15 minute overview of the case, just make sure everyone's sort of working from the same page here and uh, is familiar with all of the issues that um, we're discussing tonight and how those will play into the superintendent's race. Everyone see my slides now? I can see them. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. I all think. right. Great. Well, we'll dive in because we've got a lot to cover and not too much time. Um, Chris, Chris, I think we see the speaker screen, not the presentation screen. Gotcha. Let's uh, let's try that again. There we go. Perfect, Chris. Okay. on one second here. <clears throat> there we go. All right, now we're driving. All right, so thank you for the little technical delay there. So question I want to start with, what is Leandro? Because Leandro is a lot of things you've been hearing about in the news lately. Um, you know, in one way, Leandro is a 25 year long court case. Um, court cases are quite, quite complicated. It's a question about uh, defining legal responsibilities for who's in charge of public schools in North Carolina, whose responsibility is it to provide a high quality education. And it's also a battle over resources. Um, so it involves all the complex school funding formulas and how we can change those to redirect to do what we need to do for our kids. Um, but at the end of the day, even though that's all sounds quite complicated, at the end of the day, Leandro is really simple. It says the state has a responsibility provide every child in the state with a good education. And at least for the last 25 years, the state hasn't been doing it. Um, and it is really important to emphasize that it is the state's role in providing a sound basic education to every child. Um, that's laid out in both the constitution and in our general statute laws. Uh, so the North Carolina constitution says the general assembly shall provide by taxation and otherwise for a general and uniform system of free public schools. And then this general statute lays out, it says that, fun, that um, from state revenue sources are where schools get their money for instructional expenses. Um, it's very clear that the state is responsible for the oper all of the operating funds in our school system, and it places the responsibility for school capital needs, uh, the buildings and such, on the local county governments. Um, but this is what it looks like in uh, reality um, currently. Uh, this has been pretty consistent over the last 10, 15 years or so. 
Uh, North Carolina, 65% of operating funds come from the state, uh, about 11% from the federal government and 24% from um, local governments. So even though that is the state's responsibility to uh, fund, the, fund the, our public schools, uh, local governments are kicking in pretty significant amounts to make sure that um, our schools have the resources they need. Um, so we're discussing this Leandro case, um, a lot of what we're talking about comes from a report that was released uh, in December of this year, uh, December of 2019. Um, the two parties in the case decided to stop fighting after the 25 years and hire an outside consultant to lay forth a roadmap for what it actually takes for North Carolina to meet, finally meet its constitutional obligation to children. And so it really lays out uh, two different sort of timeframes in North Carolina. There was 95 to 09, where North Carolina was making some tenuous progress towards actually, even though we weren't meeting our uh, constitutional obligations under Leandro, uh, there was a lot of progress made. So the, the report notes that North Carolina was recognized during the 80s and 90s as an example for uh, other states. And over this time period, North Carolina was the first Southern state to score above the national average in fourth grade reading and math. And it was the most successful over this time period in narrowing the minority white achievement gap. Um, they did this through a lot of uh, programs that we were innovative. Uh, so things like Learn and Earn, which allowed high school students to uh, enroll simultaneously in a community college or university and earn up to two years of college credit uh, while simultaneously getting their high school diploma. More for a high quality pre-K program. Uh, North Carolina was leader in getting our teachers national board certification and providing them financial incentives. And also the teaching fellows, which helped grow our own uh, teaching force in North Carolina. Um, while progress was made, uh, North Carolina still obviously wasn't meeting its constitutional obligation. We never have done a great job of funding our schools. So what you see here on this chart is a measure called school funding effort. All that is, is a look at how much a state spends from state and, state and local sources as a share of the state's economy. So it's just school spending as a percentage of a state's GDP. Um, by this measure, North Carolina has fared well. Um, you can see the progress there and how we compared to other states. This is the 97 to 09 time period. Um, and in 09, you know, there was some improvement there sort of at the end of the uh, early 2000s. But North Carolina still ranked just 42nd in terms of school funding effort. Um, and at that same time, uh, other publications like Education Week gave us an F for our overall school funding levels. Um, things really changed over this last decade. As the Leandro Consultants Report notes, this past decade has left our state further away from meeting its constitutional obligation to provide every child with the opportunity for a sound basic education than it was when the Supreme Court of North Carolina issued the Leandro decision more than 20 years ago. And so what are they talking about when they talk about that? They're talking about things like teacher pay. Um, so in 0809, uh, North Carolina was 12% below the national average in teacher pay. Uh, you can see there was many years of declining average pay for North Carolina teachers. There's been some progress in recent years, um, but the progress still hasn't caught us up to where we were uh, 10 years ago. So we were 12% behind the national average in 0809. We're currently 14% uh, behind the national average as of uh, fiscal year 1819. And not surprising, our teacher pipeline is shrinking. Our pipeline's down about 30%. You know, that's not just teacher pay, that's other moves that the General Assembly has made, things like uh, taking away career status, uh, removing master's pay, taking away longevity pay. So a lot of different, uh, taking away professional development. So a lot of decisions have been made that in certain ways have undermined the teaching status. We're seeing that in our schools of education across the state. And returning back to school funding, so this is what the um, school funding effort looked like post-2009. Uh, you can see 09 was the high year when we ranked 40, uh, a not, nothing to be proud of 42nd in terms of school funding effort. Uh, that's fallen since then. We're now 48th in terms of school funding effort. Um, if North Carolina made just the average effort, the average effort that other states are making, that would require us boosting our spending by $3.6 billion. Um, 
one of, I'll also point out the brown line on the top of this uh, chart here is South Carolina. So our neighbors to the south of us that we, you know, often tend to look down on as North Carolinians, um, they're outspending us on a per student basis by 21% in their public schools. And from an effort standpoint, if we were making the same, they're also, of course, you know, less wealthy than North Carolina. And so if we were making the same effort to fund our schools as is being made in South Carolina, it would require boosting our uh, spending on public schools in the state by $5.5 billion. And the reason our effort went down is because North Carolina, unlike a lot of other states, decided to deliberately cut taxes, um, tax cuts that have mostly benefited corporations and wealthy North Carolinians. So this is the amount that has been drained from our uh, state coffers on an annual basis. Uh, in this current 2019-20 uh, fiscal year, uh, the tax cuts that have gone into, a play, gone into effect since 2012, uh, those are currently draining about $3.6 billion uh, from state coffers. So if we just had the 2012 tax code in place, uh, our state revenues would be $3.6 billion higher than where they are today. And what does that mean for our schools? It means few, compared to uh, the beginning prior to the recession, it means we have fewer teachers, fewer instructional support personnel, fewer assistant principals, fewer teacher assistants, uh, less for central office staff, even though we're asking a lot more of them, uh, less for non-instructional support, those are janitors, clericals, less for you know, dramatically less for textbook supplies. And we eliminated funding for several important, uh, several important projects, including uh, student accountability, professional development, and mentors for new teachers. Not, uh, not coincidentally, I would say, large persistent racial opportunity gaps uh, persist. So this is fourth grade math, eighth grade math, and fourth grade reading. Uh, they've all persisted or grown over this time period. So how, this Le how does this Leandro report offer us a path forward? Um, so I mentioned earlier that a consultant issued this report in December of 2019. It's a very long report um, from a company called Westhead. And they break their recommendations down into eight different buckets. Uh, for time purposes, I've sort of condensed those into five. Uh, so the first recommendation that I wanted to highlight from the report is to revise state funding uh, to make it more adequate, equitable, and efficient. And this is what the uh, funding recommendations look like for our public schools. They call for $3.7 billion of additional of long-term funding for our public schools. So that's an a increase in real terms over our current spending. Uh, North Carolina's current uh, state appropriations for public schools is about $10 billion. So this is almost a 37% increase that they're calling for in our school funding. Um, in addition to uh, this, these dollars for our public schools, uh, it also calls for about $1.2 billion for early childhood initiatives. So what could that mean? I wanted to highlight uh, what something like this could mean for Winston-Salem for Scythe County Schools. Um, there's a lot of leeway in how this is actually going to be implemented, but I just played with some numbers to see with, with that increase in state funding, what could that mean for a school district like, like for Scythe County? Um, it would be approximately $117 million of new funding, a 20% increase in teacher pay, 220 additional teacher assistants, uh, having a school nurse in every school, a counselor for every 250 students, a social worker for every 400 students, a school psychologist for every 700 students. So that's meeting the uh, meeting the ratios that's recommended by the, all those professional groups, almost $2 million more for textbooks and supplies, and very importantly, all the eligible four-year-olds in Forsyth County um, would be able, would have a spot in NC Pre-K. So the second bucket of recommendations talks about placing a well-prepared, diverse teaching force and educators in every school. And so some of the recommendations they talk about in the report is removing unnecessary barriers to entry, expanding preparation programs, uh, expanding funding for mentoring and professional development, and providing competitive pay for teachers. Uh, that last one is very important and uh, something I should have highlighted earlier. Uh, North Carolina, we talked about how North Carolina's average teacher salary compares to the national average. 
think the more important metric is how North Carolina teacher salaries compare to other professions within North Carolina. And by that measure, uh, North Carolina ranks uh, fairly low, about 45th in the state, uh, 45th in the country. Um, North Carolina teachers earn an average of 26.5% less than other professions. So that gap between teachers and other professions is uh, bigger in North Carolina than uh, just about every other state in the country. Uh, within the realm of early learning, I mentioned earlier, they called for additional $1.2 billion of funding. Uh, that's funding for Smart Start, NC Pre-K, and Child Care Subsidy. And they call for providing full day, full year pre-K to all eligible four-year-olds by the year 2026. Uh, the report also calls for uh, significantly, more, significantly more attention and resources being uh, deployed towards high poverty schools. Uh, so the report talks about providing comprehensive whole child supports. It's like I talked about earlier, the nurses, counselors, psychologists, social workers, all of those staff that we know are vital uh, to a child's development. Uh, they also mention a model called community schools to help students address out of school barriers. So uh, connecting students and families to um, public resources that are, are not traditionally considered part of the education network, education policy areas, um, providing them with health benefits and uh, access to healthcare, uh, child nutrition, all of those things that we know um, are not just uh, things that help students learn when they're in school, but are also things that, just from a moral perspective, these, these are things that every child in the state deserves. And finally, it talks about rebuilding the state capacity to support low-performing schools. That's something that's been eroded significantly over the past 10 years. In the area of assessment and accountability, uh, the report calls for scrapping A through F performance grades, taking a more holistic approach, uh, measuring progress, um, towards the state's goal of providing each child a sound based education. Uh, so they mentioned steps like uh, emphasizing growth in student performance, having measurements of school climate, and measurements of the quality of the equality of resources and learning opportunities that the state's providing to students. So what's next? Uh, the next steps in the case, uh, the judge issued a uh, ruling a couple weeks ago and that called for a draft consent orders from parties on implementation plans. And so what that means is that the judge will be at the end of March issuing a more detailed directive of what the state needs to be doing in the, this, in the short term to actually start moving towards uh, providing every, every child in the state with a sound basic education. So look for that at the very end of March. Um, it'll be interesting to see uh, specifically what's in that plan, what specific funding streams, what programs the judge will call for the General Assembly to increase. And also it'll be interesting to see whether or not there is any enforcement mechanism, um, whether or not the judge um, just says, please General Assembly go out and fund these things, or whether like it's happened in other states such as uh, Washington, uh, Kansas, New Jersey, um, whether or not the courts are going to be, put any sort of penalties in place for non-compliance on the General Assembly's part. Um, additionally, part of this, uh, part of this, uh, part of this uh, order that's going to come out at the end of March, hopefully will be details on the state monitoring plan. Um, the, it's going to be important going forward for the, this plan. It's not going to be implemented overnight. So it's going to be a very long process. So. Uh, <clears throat> The uh, West Ed report calls for setting up a body to monitor the plan and continually measure state compliance towards meeting its targets and adjust the plan where necessary. So it's going to be interesting to see uh, what details we get about that monitoring plan, who might be on that body, um, and so forth. So what can you do? Uh, first is get informed. So if you've tuned into this, hopefully I've uh, left you a little better informed about Leandro and how we have this generational opportunity right now to really change the direction of our schools and finally meet our state's constitutional requirements to provide a sound basic education for all of our students. Um, with this additional resources, I think we can do a lot more as well in terms of advancing equity in our schools. 
So think about all of those resources that should be coming in that your, your students deserve and think about what you would like your schools to look like. And to make that happen, you know, the General Assembly is not necessarily going to do this uh, on their own. It is going to take, um, I think, some political pressure from, uh, from North Carolinians. So get engaged, contact your lawmakers, talk to your friends, join coalitions, and uh, most importantly, vote for candidates who agree to support the funding implementation of the Leandro Action Plan. Thanks. Chris, I want to thank you so much for such a mighty presentation on the Leandro Report that really makes clear the important implications of it. Two questions that have come to my mind as I was watching this presentation that hopefully will provide a good segue for us, Chris. I was hoping you could uh, speak to one. It seems like you are talking about a potential receivership sort of situation, but one that the General Assembly would essentially have to agree to where we've seen in other states that a court puts a prison system in a state's prison system in receivership, puts a school system in receivership. Is that the possibility here with this uh, ruling by the judge in 60 days? Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. So, you know, of course, to have the um, General Assembly is the body that appropriates money in this state. So in order to have this have these resources show up for our school, <laughs> make the reforms that the report calls for, it's gonna take significant action from the general. <coughs> um, what we've seen in other states that have had similar lawsuits has really varied. Um, so for example, Ohio, they had a court case. Um, they ruled that the state was meeting its constitutional obligation and they issued that ruling and basically then the courts just sort of packed up and went home. Um, New York, the general assembly uh, met a portion of what the courts called for. Um, they didn't f fully uh, fund their schools as was called for, but the court said, that's good enough, we're gonna go home. Um, other states, so New Jersey, Kansas, I feel like there's one more I'm forgetting, uh, maybe New Mexico. Um, there, what the court said is they said, listen, you know, your laws. We lost your own. Chris, I lost your audio. Yeah, I lost your audio. I don't know if others did too. All right. So I was saying, um, what's the, what uh, New Mexico, um, Kansas, and New Jersey did is that the court said, listen, you know, your your school funding laws are unconstitutional, and the courts have the power to strike down unconstitutional laws. So if you know what they they basically placed an ultimatum on their general assemblies. They said, if you don't put in place a constitutional uh, system for our schools by X date, we're gonna shut down the schools. Um, in Kansas and New Mexico, the General Assembly's there acted prior to that date. In New Jersey, the schools were actually shut down briefly. Um, the General Assembly had an emergency session to actually, to finally fund the uh, court's requirements. Uh, Washington, they sort of went a step further and uh, the courts there were fining the General Assembly, I believe, $100,000 a day. And wow. They uh, actually provided the funding for schools. So a lot of different options. It'll be interesting to see uh, what Judge Lee does at the end of March. That's great. Thanks so much. That's really helpful um, to understand the potential implications of this in the context of what we're doing here tonight with this forum for North Carolina State Superintendent candidates. What do you think is the most important role that candidates from North Carolina State Superintendent can play in response to or in relation to this Leandro case in the report? Um, uh, it would be good to see what the uh, candidates themselves say. They probably have better, they probably thought more about the role of superintendent than I have. Um, but I think really, I really think it's really going to be the power of the bully pulpit being most important from the state superintendent um, and making sure that not only does the General Assembly meet its fulfill its goal, but in shaping the plan as well. Um, so the West Ed report, what we've seen so far, has a lot of good sort of broad-based recommendations, but there's a lot of details that still need to be worked out by policymakers across the state. And I think it'll be the superintendent's role to make sure that uh, those details are worked out in a way that, um, that 
really provide the focus on equity that the state's been lacking for the past uh, 10 years or so. Great. Chris, thanks so much for that insight, for that great presentation. With that in mind, we do want to turn uh, towards our form of discussion uh, with the candidates. Certainly will be interested to hear their thoughts uh, on this case and report uh, that came in response to it, as well as the other questions that our moderator uh, has for them tonight. And to the moderate, I want to introduce Dr. Anthony Graham, who I've had the pleasure of meeting on several uh, occasions. He is the Provost and Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs at Winston-Salem State University. Uh, he was a tenured full professor and Dean of the College of Education at North Carolina A&T State University. Um, he earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in English with a minor in mathematics at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, as well as a Master of Education degree in secondary English education and a Doctor of Philosophy in Curriculum and Teaching from the University of North Carolina uh, at Greensboro. He has experience in the classroom uh, as a high school English teacher. Uh, he's been involved in helping to secure over $10 million um, in various research grants uh, through both the National Science Foundation, United States Department of Education. He has authored uh, a number of articles and he has been involved on a number of boards uh, in 2014, the Piedmont Tries Business Journal Magazine recognized Dr. Graham as a 2014 uh, 40 Leaders Under the Age of 40 Award recipient, and he also received the 2014 Sarah Herbin Award from the Black Child Development Institute uh, in Greensboro. The National Association of Negro Business and Professional Women's Clubs Incorporated recognized him as one of its young leaders on the move and the Empire Corporation named him one of the top young executives professionals in the United States. Dr. Anthony Graham, we're glad to have you here tonight. And at this point, I will turn the forum over to you to introduce our candidates. Thank you, Dr. Ford. I appreciate it. Can everyone hear me? I can. All right, great. Good evening to everyone. I'm pleased to serve as the moderator for tonight's equity forum. Um, I would like to thank each of you for joining us and for working with us as we traverse the inclement weather. We truly appreciate your flexibility and we thank our event organizers for their quick thinking and their adaptability. Um, we also want to thank our candidates for their willingness to adjust to accommodate us to join us via this Zoom conference format. I have the pleasure at this time to introduce my co-moderator, Mr. Marcus Bass. Mr. Bass is the Executive Director of Advanced North Carolina. Advanced North Carolina is a statewide independent black-led 501c4 organization with a mission to build political and economic power in black communities and institutions of North Carolina. Advanced Carolina educates and mobilizes African-American and progressive voters to take charge of their communities amid inclusive, committed, and authentic engagement in order to advance community-based political solutions. As a point of personal privilege, I must note that Mr. Bass is one of my former students who was a North Carolina teaching fellow in the uh, teacher preparation program at North Carolina A&T State University when I was on faculty there. Uh, Mr. Bass taught three years in career and technical education in the Clinton City Schools and worked for three years as Uniserve Director for NCAE. He's also a member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. Mr. Bass, welcome and thank you for co-moderating tonight's Equity Forum. Thank you, Dr. Graham. Thank you to the sponsors and thank you to the candidates for participating. Thank you again, Mr. Bass. At this time, I would like to introduce the four candidates who seek the position of the North Carolina State Superintendent of Public Instruction who were able to join us this evening via this teleconference format. With us this evening, we have as follows, Mr. James Barrett. Mr. Barrett has been on the Chapel Hill Carborough School Board for the past eight years and currently serves as its vice chairman. Mr. Barrett has worked as a consultant and program manager for Lenovo in Morrisville for the past five years. Thank you for being with us this evening, Mr. Barrett. We also Thank have you, joining us. Thank you. We also have joining us Dr. Michael Marr who has worked as an educator at the high school level as a science teacher for public schools in Forsyth and Wake Counties 
as well as an administrator in the College of Education at North Carolina State University. Dr. Moore currently serves as president of the North Carolina Association of Colleges and Teacher Educators and vice chairman of the North Carolina Professional Educator Preparation and Standards Commission. Welcome, Dr. Moore, and thank you for joining us this evening. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Graham. We also have with us Dr. Jen Mangrum. Dr. Mangrum is currently an associate professor in the School of Education at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. Prior to her higher education experience, Dr. Mangrum spent 14 years teaching at elementary schools in Onslow and Guilford counties. Thank you, Dr. Mangrum, for joining us this evening. And finally, we have with us Mr. Keith Sutton. Mr. Sutton is the founder of Focus Ed LLC, a firm designed to support organizations in the improvement and transformation of education. He previously spent time as the Excellence Director for Best NC and Education Think Tank. Mr. Sutton currently serves as the chair of the Wake County Board of Education. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Sutton. Thank you, Dr. Graham. Glad to be here. Before we transition to our questions, I would like to share with our audience our ground rules for our conversation this evening. Mr. Bass and I will present the candidates with an array of questions that cover various topics relative to educational equity. Each candidate will have two minutes to respond to the inquiry that we present. We will monitor this time closely to ensure that each person has an opportunity to respond adequately to the question. So we've asked our candidates to honor our request to bring closure to their responses when we indicate that they have reached their time limit. We will share with each candidate the order in which we will pose the question after we've presented that question. So with that context, we will get started with the questions for tonight's equity forum. We will begin by asking each candidate to please share with us why you have chosen to pursue the elected position of the North Carolina State Superintendent of Public Schools and operationalize for us your definition of educational equity. We'll begin with Mr. Barrett, then go to, Mr. to Dr. Marr, then to Dr. Mangrum, then to Mr. Sutton. Again, Barrett, Marr, Mangrum, Sutton. Thank you so much, and uh, it's great to be with you all from Winston-Salem and across the state because uh, we're doing this virtually. Uh, I have uh, I've been an elected school board member for the last eight years, uh, serving students um, uh, across in Chapel Hill, Carborough. Uh, I believe strongly in uh, in the need to to serve all students, and that our schools cannot be successful unless each and every student is being successful. And so, this opportunity to to run for state superintendent um, and make a difference for all the students across the state um, is is what's motivating me to, to do this work, um, you know, in the many sleepless nights that it uh, entails to, to make it happen. But um, but this is uh, this really critically important work that has to happen, um, and and I believe equity is the, the heart of what of what we must do. Um, we, as I said, we we're not successful unless each and every student is successful. Um, and, and I believe in education, uh, our, our equity means that we're providing for the needs of each and every student um, so that they have those opportunities to be successful. So uh, wh whatever it takes to, uh, to provide those needs, as, um, as Chris mentioned before, to have the, the bully pulpit of the office. I have a, a background in community organizing and advocacy um, to make that happen if that's what it takes. I also believe that the Department of Public Instruction needs to do a much better job at providing support to all the districts across the state. Um, and I have a professional executive leadership experience, um, more so than, than any, any of the other people running here, um, to be effective in, make, in making the department effective um, in serving the needs that exist across the state. Uh, and then I also believe that my time on the school board um, and using the levers of policy uh, effectively and creatively uh, and for the benefit of all students and, and benefit of teachers um, can be really useful as well across the state. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Baird. Dr. Moore? Good evening. Uh, yeah, I want to thank you again for the opportunity to be here. And I'm actually in a hotel room here in Greensboro, uh, so not too far away from Winston-Salem. Uh, as I thought a lot about this, this race and, and why I got into it, um, I think it starts with with my history. You know, Chris talked a little bit about some other states that have that have had cases similar to Leandro. I'm actually a graduate of an Abbott district in New Jersey, and so I understand 
what it means to go to chronically under-resourced public schools throughout your career. Uh, it's the, the primary reason I chose to become a teacher. Um, and then it's the reason that uh, I went on to move into teacher preparation to try to prepare uh, outstanding educators for North Carolina public schools. Uh, so I specifically got into this race because I started advocating back in 2013. I started writing, uh, I started doing some, some interviews and, um, and working to, to put myself into leadership positions in the, in the teacher preparation community. And that led to uh, my, my election as the president of the North Carolina Association of Colleges and Teacher Educators. That all provided me some opportunities to work uh, on statewide policy. And then my role as the vice chair of the Standards Commission has given me even greater opportunity to have some influence. The last three years plus, I think we've seen a, some significant issues in the Department of Public Instruction. We've seen a loss of morale. We've seen good people leaving the department. And so uh, being in and around the department, serving on the commission and in other capacities, uh, I felt like there was not only a lack of leadership, there was a lack of vision. And my, I've been fortunate in my career to, to work in the area of leadership and, and development. And so felt like uh, in order to move in this kind of next, take this next step to continue my, my advocacy work and, and speaking out for schools and students, that it was, it was time to, to take this step and, and run for the office. Uh, when I think about operationalizing equity, it's really about, for me, it's about developing policies and programs that acknowledge the worth and dignity of children, caregivers, and educators. And, and it's really about ensuring that every child in North Carolina has access and opportunity to achieve their full potential. Thank you, Dr. Moore. Dr. Mangle. Thank you for having us, and I apologize for both me and my puppy uh, barking, so excuse me. Um, so it was interesting when Chris said that the 80s and 90s, we were, um, we were a beacon for the rest of the country because schools in North Carolina were held in such high regard. And that's exactly when I was teaching, from 1987 until 2001. And after um, 2016, I decided that politics was not a spectator sport because I'd watch schools, as Chris described, um, continue to decrease in funding, to provide teachers with less opportunity for um, autonomy, for uh, having respect, they were not valued. Um, if we don't take care of our teachers and our students suffer. Um, so I decided to uh, throw my hat in the ring. Uh, I ran for Senate to save public education. Um, I joined a group called Save Our Schools because that's exactly what I wanted to do. I knew that with um, I taught hundreds of kids over the 14 years. I've taught hundreds of teachers, so thousands of hours in the classroom. Uh, I had created a program at State, uh, which was a multi-million dollar project, and I was the, the leader. I'd stayed there um, as an administrator and then went to UNCG, where I've been working um, to create the next generation of teachers. Uh, the course I'm teaching right now, in 2008, I had over 200 students. Um, this semester, I have 57 is the introduction to teaching. Um, so we know our pipeline is shrinking and there's a crisis. Um, so I wanted to get involved to save public education. Uh, to define uh, equity, educational equity, uh, I ask my students often, how do you provide excellence and equity in the classroom? Um, because what I see often is um, excellence in pockets, um, even excellence in the same classroom, but not for every child. And I think that is super important that people start thinking, that teachers start thinking that every child um, is brilliant, that we need to build on their strengths, that we can um, have high expectations for all our students. And we have to recognize our own weaknesses, um, our own biases, um, and what keep us from giving children the type of education they need. Um, I would just say that for me, excellence means that it's rigorous, it's integrated, it's relevant to students, um, it engages them in high quality work. And in order to do that for every child, the state of North Carolina needs to uh, fund teachers and fund schools so that we can do that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mangrum. Mr. Sutton. Yes. Uh... 
and good evening. Thanks for the opportunity to be here. Um, I want to run to be the next state superintendent because I saw over the back, going back to 2014, 2015, where the leadership and our general assembly uh, continued to cut and cut uh, and cut uh, away at our public education budget uh, and that of the Department of Public Instruction. Uh, and I felt like it was time to to get into uh, uh, the fight and, and stop this really attack that we've seen on public education, not just in North Carolina, but uh, uh, across the state. Uh, I have uh, experience in working uh, in uh, civil rights and being in advocacy. Uh, I started out uh, my career early as executive director for the state uh, NAACP here in North Carolina. Uh, also spent several years working with the uh, Triangle Urban League. I actually founded the Triangle Urban League uh, here in Raleigh-Durham, I uh, served the CEO of that organization for uh, several years. I share that because I have a, a background and experience in uh, advocacy and using public policy uh, as a lever to improve the lives of uh, uh, minority communities, uh, those that don't have uh, a voice for themselves and know how to advocate for themselves. Uh, and so that's the kind of fight that I think we need uh, to restore uh, the funding that Chris, the lost funding that Chris talked about uh, early in his uh, presentation. Uh, in terms of operationalizing uh, equity, uh, I think that we've got to start with uh, having an equity plan, a statewide equity plan, uh, that working along with uh, the, the state board, uh, putting together a vision for how we achieve equity, uh, educational equity across uh, North Carolina. Uh, and that would signal uh, our intentionality around closing gaps, uh, closing student achievement gaps. Uh, closing uh, equity funding gaps, where we see uh, significant gaps in funding between urban and rural uh, counties uh, across the state, uh, looking at uh, our teacher diversity uh, and closing and addressing uh, those gaps, gaps in student discipline. Uh, all of these we need to set meaningful uh, targets uh, and a specific timeline uh, as to how we will uh, address and close those gaps uh, in, a, in a specified period of time. And so that, I think that it starts with uh, putting together an equity plan for the state uh, that will also serve uh, as a model uh, for local districts uh, to establish similar um, equity plans uh, and together across uh, this state working with the 115 LEAs across North Carolina, uh, I think we can uh, make some meaningful, uh, do some meaningful work in terms of closing the gaps and uh, achieving equity for all students across North Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Fedden. So I have the uh, pleasure of asking the next two questions. I think that the first is more along the lines of, of the basic introductions and, and getting to know you all better for those that are participating. The first question I have, when assessing the state and our current superintendent's policies and initiatives, some educators and stakeholders argue that his decisions have exacerbated inequities in our North Carolina public schools. What specific policy reforms, programs, or initiatives would you continue or discontinue to promote educational equity and why? And the order for this round of questioning will go in reverse. We'll start with candidate Sutton, and then we'll go to candidate Mangrum, and then candidate Marr, and then we'll end with candidate Barrett. Uh, in terms of the specific policies uh, uh, and reforms, I don't know that there is much that the current uh, state superintendent has done to promote uh, uh, equity. Uh, as I stated earlier, I think one, uh, having a, an equity plan uh, uh, that would again serve as a guide uh, for both the state uh, and LEAs across North Carolina. Uh, I think also restoring um, the capacity uh, that used to be in the uh, and uh, DPI that provided support to our lower performing schools. Uh, I think that would help us to, to call out and address uh, both race and poverty uh, in North Carolina and how that uh, impacts student achievement. Uh, that would allow us to take uh, a broader look, I think, at right now, what are the 69 schools that are on, on what is considered to be the state's low performing list um, and how we might uh, address and really support uh, those those districts. And so I think, uh, and it used to be the the uh, 
Department of uh, Division of School and District Transformation. I'd uh, rather we restore that department or call it something else. Uh, I think we need to have uh, that uh, capacity uh, and professional uh, experts in that area that help to support uh, our lowest performing uh, or underperforming schools. Uh, I think those would be the two primary things uh, in terms of reform. Uh, I think the, the work around uh, MTSS uh, and, and the multi-tier multi systems of support that help to at least begin a, uh, provide some basis around addressing social emotional learning needs uh, of students uh, would be one that I would certainly uh, want to continue uh, but perhaps add some um, some changes uh, to that 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 look more at um, the social emotional learning needs of students with respect to building resilience uh, uh, and addressing uh, adverse childhood experiences and trauma in students would be another part uh, as well. Thank you, Kennedy Mangrum. Thank you. Um, I've been thinking about uh, several initiatives that I would like to. Um, to develop and foster in this position. And one is an Office of Equity Affairs for the state. Because as I've traveled the state campaigning, I'm recognizing that different districts have different amount of support. My job is to provide resources and to eliminate barriers. Uh, Wake County has um, an equity office of eight. I met with Dr. Rodney Trice and talked a lot about how it was structured and the things it was able to do. Um, and I asked him, what would that look like at the state level? And I got pretty excited that this could be something that, um, that had people who were inclusive and equity experts um, step in and help us run and think about and then provide resources and help to people across the state um, or districts across the state that don't have the same access. Uh, another thing that I'm excited about is um, there's Professional development has been a huge part of my life. I've traveled the country working for the National Padilla Center. Uh, professional development is what will help our teachers move from wherever they are on their teaching continuum towards being a master or being accomplished. Um, and I've thought about uh, facilities such as Charlotte Hawkins Brown uh, campus. Charlotte Hawkins Brown taught uh, black females and the um, Facilities not too far from Greensboro and Burlington. It's right in between and it's got dormitories and classrooms. And my thought was creating an institute of teaching and learning that would support professional development for practicing teachers, but also put them in roles of leadership. Um, but in addition, bring the schools of ed from our 17 public universities into this institute. Um, we need a bridge that brings what we know in schools of ed and the research with practicing teachers. Um, and then Charlotte Hawkins Brown gives it that really nice context for thinking about issues around race and poverty. Uh, also in experiencing what Guilford County has to offer in terms of um, its own history, uh, its own history in civil rights. Um, so I just think there's a- Dr. Maker, yeah. I, I hate to interrupt you, at your two minute mark. Okay, thank you. Well, those are two of them. Thank you very much, candidate Mangrum, candidate Marr. Yeah, thank you. So when I when I launched my campaign uh, a year ago, uh, I launched it with uh, three big themes in mind, right? So this idea of equity, excellence, and innovation. And I didn't just talk about equity as this kind of buzzword, but rather what does it actually look like in practice? And so I led with some policy ideas that I think are really important. So the first one is accountability reform. And I think we use accountability reform to address the inequity that we find throughout our state. So one, uh, when I launched last year, I talked about eliminating A through F grading. I think everybody knows, everybody on this call likely knows A through F grading uh, does nothing but stigmatize uh, children and, and teachers and communities. So we need to move away. It was bad policy in 2013. It is still bad policy today. I think we eliminate the A through F grade. We expand our report cards to, to more encompassing dashboards that include measures of access, measures of opportunity. So we need to be measuring things like access to AIG programs and access to AP and IB programs in high schools. We also need to look at suspension rates and be looking at disproportionality in suspension. Uh, we need to look at principal experience. We know that matters for both teacher, teacher retention and student performance. So we need to think about broader based metrics to look at school performance. And then we can turn around and provide targeted resource when we find that, that schools are having some challenges. I think we also need to include measures of social emotional learning as one of our performance measures. 
uh, and we need to update our teacher working condition survey so that we can measure the, the health and well-being of teachers. I also think that once, once we can identify uh, where we have schools that actually need support, we can then go back and target that. I think Keith was on point when we talk about bringing our, our resources together under one, one unit or one division. You've got district and school transformation. Uh, we, we run a number of different programs in this state and, and within the Department of Public Instruction, they're located in different places. So if you've got federal uh, district support programs, they're in one place and then we, we situate the renewal school district option in a different place. And we can look at other programs like the advanced teaching roles could be viewed as one of these district supports, yet it exists in a different place. So we have to think about candidate, how can we pull those. Candidate Moore, you're at your two minute mark. Okay, thank you. Thank you, candidate Mark. Candidate Barrett. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, so, uh, Dr. Bangram um, talks about this this office of, of equity, and um, I, I thank her for for joining on the bandwagon. And I actually ran on that idea in 2011, the first time I ran for the school board, um, and got it implemented within the first year of uh, of being on the board in Chapel Hill, Carborough. Dr. Trice was uh, was the person that we promoted into that role uh, before he moved over to Wake County. Um, and when I thought about moving to the state level. Um, is that I'm, I'm concerned um, sometimes when we separate that work into a separate department uh, that it actually um, it takes away some of the responsibility from the people um, because if we truly believe that equity is the work um, of each and every person in our school systems um, then we need to make sure that everybody has that responsibility uh, for delivering equity uh, to to our district so all the people who are setting standards, all the people who are uh, talking about how we use SROs, uh, all, everybody in the Department of Public Instruction um, needs to view equity as a key part of their, of their work. And similarly, I would say that, that my biggest plan for moving forward is the Leandro report. Um, we have 300 pages of, of suggestions, 42 of them, that are really all focused on how do we deliver success for each and every student across the state. Um, and if that's my definition of equity, um, then that is the work that needs to happen. Um, and it needs to be driven by the state superintendent um, across all the systems, um, not just the, the LEAs, but, but all the various uh, stakeholders that we have um, to happen so that our students benefit. And so, um, you know, making sure we have high quality teachers, making sure we have diverse teachers, making sure that we have great principals, which we don't talk enough about uh, the importance that, that they, the leadership that they provide, uh, all those pieces, adequate funding certainly as well, and the support systems that, um, that Chris talked about, uh, nurses and such, all, all that is part of the equity work that needs to happen across the state. Thank you very much, Candidate Barrett. The second question really leans into educational equity policies. I think there was a lot of conversation in this first round in regards to um, some structural things. And I think now the policy conversation really leaning in a little bit more into what Chris shared during the uh, report out around the Leandro report. Um, so this question in relation to educational equity, in that presentation, we heard some of the recommendations relative to achieving educational equity in the state of North Carolina. Could you share with us any policies or programs that were not included in the report that you feel are just as important in advancing educational equity? And for this round of questioning, we're gonna start with candidate Marr and then go to candidate Sutton and then third will be candidate Barrett, and last will be candidate Mangrum. We'll start with candidate Marr. Yeah, so I think there were, there were a number of, of items within the report, I think expansion of the teaching fellows is one, but perhaps one that, that folks aren't talking about is how do we use policy levers to both recruit and retain more teachers of color? And so uh, additionally, how do we recruit and retain more teachers in our hard to staff schools and hard to staff subjects. One of the things we know is that our most vulnerable children are often uh, being taught by our, our least experienced teachers and more lateral entry teachers than, than other children. So one of the things I think we have to start talking about is how do we incentivize uh, teachers and what meaningful ways can we incentivize teachers to work in our more challenging schools and our schools that are, that are disproportionately under-resourced uh, and, and schools that are uh, perhaps in some instances more, more rural uh, or, or lack some of the same resources that some of our large districts do. 
So I think we have to talk about compensation in a real way. We also have to talk more, and, and perhaps this is the role, as, as Chris had mentioned, kind of the bully pulpit of the superintendent, uh, with just increasing salaries uh, overall. So we know that, that uh, students who graduate from education programs tend to carry a greater debt burden than other, ma than other majors, and that, that's because of the, the cost of tuition and then uh, you know, low salaries. So we have to think about uh, appropriate compensation. So we need, we need better salaries for teachers and other educators. Uh, and then we need to think about strategic ways in which we can get more high quality individuals into our lowest resource schools. Thank you very much. Kenneth Sutton. Yes, sir. Three, three things that I think um, will be some significant uh, policy uh, initiatives that were not mentioned. Uh, one, and this may have been mentioned, but looking at funding formulas uh, and how we fund uh, districts across the state, uh, again, we see some significant gaps in terms of uh, the funding that we're able to provide here in uh, Wake County. Uh, versus uh, the funding that is available in uh, some of our tier two and uh, uh, tier one and tier two counties uh, across the state. Much of that funding uh, uh, is based on, uh, as we know, ADM, uh, but a lot of it is also based on the local funding and the ability to, to provide funding to our districts uh, based on local tax base, uh, because many of our, our districts provide supplements to our teacher salaries uh, and that sort of thing. And so. Uh, there's a huge uh, uh, equity piece around the funding. Um, second, looking at charter schools and the impact that charters have uh, on our districts. Uh, in most cases, charter schools, we segregate districts and we segregate uh, our communities. Uh, so looking at how we can uh, either slow down or, or cap uh, uh, the proliferation uh, of charters, uh, I think will help us to uh, address um, much of the equity uh, uh, challenges that we see. Uh, across the state. Uh, and then I think, uh, uh, and part of that I think would, would be our requiring our districts to look at uh, their boundary lines. Uh, I, I would try to implement or work with boards to think about how every five to 10 years, uh, every district across the state uh, looks at, uh, or at least, at least considers redrawing their boundary lines uh, so that we don't end up having uh, districts where we've not seen uh, a student reassignment plan in more than 30, 40, 50 years. Uh, in, that, in that period of time, you, you, you've seen uh, communities with have and have not schools. And so if we're gonna balance some of that, uh, uh, balance, looking at equity, we've gotta address uh, some of that at the local level. And then lastly, teacher recruitment and diversity recruitment and looking at uh, having more meaningful partnerships with our uh, particular HBCUs and the schools of education uh, at our HBCUs, uh, I think could play a leading role uh, in helping us to close that teacher diversity gap. Thank you very much. Candidate Barrett. Yeah, I, I think the biggest thing that's not referenced in the report um, is our discipline disparities. Um, and we know that that exists uh, all across the state um, and that, that our, our African American and our Hispanic students are, are not being fairly treated. Uh, and then they end up being out of the classroom and losing instructional time um, in, instead of uh, actually having, having more time uh, to, to, to catch up. Um, for for uh, you know for for issues that that that, that exist and so um, I always when we started examining this in Chapel Hill Carborough um, the one that really really uh, shocked me was that the number two reason that we suspend students or we did suspend students um, was for skipping school um, and so we had this punishment where we were keeping kids out of school uh, because they had they had missed school and it certainly uh, wasn't helping anybody learn. Um, and it wasn't really doing doing a good job. And so we need to, uh, at a state level, we need to provide the the resources to help districts uh, be more restorative in their in their discipline work, um, and also be more explicit in their codes of conduct and expectations, so that uh, all students are treated equitably, um, and that we're actually focusing on teaching kids first, um, and, and not uh, and not not punishing um, as the first thing. Um, I think there's also a lot of work to be done in terms of making sure that we have culturally relevant materials of available and, and the state can play a part in um, providing some guidance and some, some suggestions for materials. Uh, certainly Chris is uh, pointing out that uh, the textbook funding um, and providing more money to be able to purchase those materials is gonna help. Uh, but we also need to make sure at a state level that we're encouraging and, um, and 
in helping districts uh, make those materials culturally relevant so that students can get the most out of, uh, all students um, can get the most out of the materials that they're, that they're given with, uh, with newfound money. So um, those are the two biggest things that I think are not in the report um, that need to be addressed. Thank you very much. Candidate Mangrum. Uh, some of the things that I would like to see around policy is a change in the way we test um, and the way we hold our teachers and children accountable. Right now, it's a very shameful process. Uh, if you're a third grader and you are three out of five uh, as proficient, score three, uh, you take home a letter that says you are not on trajectory to be college or career ready. And that's an eight-year-old. Um, I think that testing the way it is right now is very shameful, it's very labeling, and we need to uh, take some time to write policy around that. Um, kind of along the lines of what James said, I'd like to see us rectify the curriculum and have some policy discussions about what is taught in classrooms. I teach elementary social studies at UNCG. Um, it's surprising to me how much the students don't know about history, um, particularly in regards to any other immigrant group other than white, uh, Anglo-Saxon. Um, I think it was uh, Al McShirley that used the term rectifying with me, but I really like that um, so that we can start having honest conversations about the roles of um, figures in history and the role race has played in where we are now. Um, and then finally, I think that we need to do something around the first thousand days. And while um, the Leandro report talks about uh, more at four or starting with four-year-old pre-K, um, we know that our children's brains develop right from the time they're born and the first two years are the most critical in terms of nutrition and, and stimulation and um, engaging with parents. Um, right now I went to um, uh, Book Harvest the other day where they have book babies uh, and a nurse or a person uh, reaches out to families three times a year, uh, brings books, talks to the family about getting that baby on track for four-year-olds, for, for, for pre-K, um, preparing them. And so they have 80 each year. So those children are going to pre-K at four being way more prepared and their families are more prepared and supportive. So I think there's policies we can do that we haven't even thought of yet that will benefit all our children, but particularly those that are marginalized. Great, thank you. We're going to continue to lean into the West Ed Leandro report a little more. And the question I have for you is, the West Ed report recommends adding, and I quote, measures of student opportunities to learn, unquote. In your role as the state superintendent of public instruction, what specific measures would you advocate that we should collect that would most reflect whether all students are receiving equitable opportunities to learn and how would you advocate for the inclusion of those metrics in the state's accountability model? The order that we'll follow, candidate Mangrum, candidate Barrett, candidate Sutton, candidate Marr. We'll begin with you, candidate Mangrum. Thank you. So if we're looking at opportunity, we know when we watch the, um, Chris showed us a graph of the achievement gap, right? And our students are starting behind. Um, but every time they went up, it went up when it went down, uh, whether you're poverty or not, it, there was the same kind of curve. Um, and what's happening in between there is the lack of opportunities. Uh, and so it's more of an opportunity gap than achievement gap. And the ways we need to measure and find out how schools are providing opportunities in that gap would be uh, certainly surveys, parent conversations, um, actually schools submitting kind of plans for how they're going to meet those opportunities. Um, I was a, in an impoverished situation in my teens. Um, I talked to people about how I was offered the opportunity to go to governor school, really changed my life in ways, um, but I was given that opportunity. So we have to be really aware of who we're giving opportunities to um, and how those opportunities are gonna impact them along the way. Um, I, I also think that in the summer, we know that our children slump, that there's a summer slump. And my understanding is that if we took away that slump, um, the gap would shrink by two thirds, according to Malbert Smith uh, uh, of Metametrics. And so we have to be thinking about opportunities that schools are providing in the summer um, and the quality of those because students need uh, year round support, uh, particularly in literacy and problem solving. Um, again, how we measure it to me is a lot of uh, written plans, 
talking to parents, uh, working with teachers. Um, teachers have not had a voice at the table. And I really feel like if we had a table sitting around here with practicing teachers, um, particularly I, I wanna create an advisory of black male teachers because they know how to recruit teachers of color and they know what their experience has been. Um, so not just me, but this group kind of thinking about how do we eliminate uh, the gap? How do we create opportunities for kids and how do we measure that? Thank you. Candidate Barrett. Yeah, so I'm a big data guy, and I know um, Dr. Marr is going to talk about uh, his dashboard ideas, and, um, and, I, and, I, and I echo that because I think that there's a lot of different measurements uh, that we know as human beings, we respond to, to measurements and being told whether we're being successful or not. I've actually seen that, um, and I used to work at a call center at IBM, and um, literally you could just change what you show up on the screen. You didn't have to change compensation models. You didn't have to bring out a whip or, or do anything you know, different. You just had to tell people where they were against very measurements, and you would see behavior change uh, on the fly. And so um, I do believe we could do a lot to measure uh, opportunity gaps, um, you know, whether it be uh, advanced placement courses, uh, whether it be the, the, the great work that, that Wake County has done. So, you know, I applaud Keith for that um, and the work that they've done to get students into advanced math classes uh, based on their, their predicted scores and uh, making sure that that's, uh, that's encouraged across the board. Uh, whether it be the, um, you know, the gaps that we know exist in, in recruitment of teachers of color. Um, and we've seen, you know, we've had a lot of focus on that in Chapel Hill Carver over the last couple of years. And we literally in one year um, increased 50% the number of African American teachers uh, that we hired. So um, I, I do know that focusing on the data and providing measurements that actually align with our values um, and what we want to see happen, just providing those measurements and having people talk about those things uh, on a regular basis um, can be benefit, will be beneficial um, in providing the results that we want to see. Um, and, and so it's, um, there's a slew of things that we can measure and we need to talk about um, you know, what it is that, that really gets us to the goals we want to see. But we, we do know that, that there are, um, there are gaps. You know, there's, there's over-identification of special needs. There's under-identification of gifted services. Um, and all those things um, we need to be really upfront about. And it's, it's a little embarrassing at first, um, but if we begin to talk about it on a regular basis, I do believe we'll see changes in the data or in the results that we get for students. Thank you, Candidate Barrett. Candidate Sutton. Sure, so I think there are three things that, that we could look at measuring in terms of considering uh, students opportunity to learn. Uh, the first is looking at, looking at uh, teacher effectiveness. Um, when the U.S. Department of Education talks about uh, equity, uh, it's very specific in its definition, and that is ensuring that every student uh, has equitable access to uh, an effective teacher. Uh, and so I think some of the work starts uh, with uh, working with uh, teachers, uh, HR professionals from uh, some of our local districts uh, to, to sort of determine what we mean when we say uh, effectiveness. Uh, is effectiveness uh, based on uh, uh, growth or proficiency, uh, uh, master's degree, national board certified, uh, I would argue that it's a combination of, of all of those uh, measures uh, and then looking at how we uh, pair uh, our most uh, effective teachers with the students that need them the most. Uh, the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill now is engaged in a, uh, a pilot project or study uh, looking at uh, just how we might uh, uh, scientifically at how we uh, again pair those effective teachers uh, with student learning styles. Um, the second would be measuring uh, 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 ACEs and looking at uh, using ACEs to measure uh, uh, childhood trauma. Uh, and as we look at students coming into our classrooms, uh, what level of trauma uh, they are uh, impacted or affected by, uh, looking at the, uh, what their ACEs score uh, uh, would be so that we have uh, some sense in terms of being able to uh, respond to the social emotional learning uh, needs and learning styles uh, and therefore improving uh, their ability to uh, to learn and retain information. Uh, the third one also I think would be uh, looking at how we might measure. Senator Sutton, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to stop you there. You're at your two-minute mark. Okay. All right, thank you. Senator Moore. 
Yeah, so I think we've heard some great ideas to this point. Um, what I would look to seek to do is, is change our mindset. I think for far too long, we've talked a lot of, in, in this state, we've really been data driven. So this whole idea that we're chasing this, the, the test score, and we've got too many legislators and others that they're, they're hyper-focused on uh, very specific proficiency rates to the detriment of everything else. Uh, I think we need to move to a, to a data-informed approach. And so this idea that rather than being driven by a specific data point, we need to be able to use data more effectively to start building the case that some schools are extremely effective and some schools need significant support. And then how do we target that support? So I think along those lines, we absolutely do need to be looking at things like suspension rates. That, that's really about access. Do students have access? Opportunity. Do students have access to AIG programs, uh, as James was talking about? Um, but we also need to think about, do they have access to high quality teachers? The example I would give also is some of the work that we did at NC State. So when we were building our model for accountability and teacher preparation, we were never focused on single data points because one data point can tell you, tells you very little about the performance of your program, about the performance of candidates, uh, or about the performance of the college. It's really about looking at multiple pieces of data and in what direction does that data point. And so how can we tell a story about the kinds of data that we collect? And the data can be quantitative data, it can be qualitative data. Uh, so we have to be really smart about what we're collecting. I think we also need to think hard about uh, teacher evaluation because teacher evaluation can be one of those linchpins for us to help move us away from this idea about effectiveness being about test scores. Uh, and so that's gonna take some work with uh, those who are, are working in school leadership programs uh, and then working with district superintendents around the area of uh, ensuring that principals are, are using the most effective ways in which to evaluate teachers in the field. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, one of the areas with the greatest racial disparity in our public schools is school discipline. According to the Racing Inequities Report, the state of racial equity in North Carolina public schools authored by the Center for Racial Equity in Education, also known as CREED, C-R-E-E-D, black students were 160% more likely to receive in-school suspension and 84% more likely to receive out-of-school suspension than white students. In your role as state superintendent, what is the key to address these disparities? This order for questioning will start with candidate Barrett, then candidate Mayor, then candidate Mangrum, and we'll end with candidate Sutton. Candidate Barrett. So this is a this is a really tough problem, right? It, it is uh, one that we have uh, spent a lot of time in Chapel Hill Carver uh, working on, um, and I'm I'm proud of the work that we've done, uh, particularly around restorative practices, uh, to make sure that we're viewing any sort of uh, uh, discipline issue that comes up as an opportunity to teach kids um, and to to restore relationships uh, before that we focus before we focus on on punishment, and so. Um, I think that is a that is a key first step that that all any district can do, uh, particularly if we provide support from the state to um, to have the funding available for for professional development around that. Um, but as we've made significant progress in reducing the overall rates, and so we have fewer students that are affected um, by our uh, punishments in particular being suspended, um, the disparities have persisted. We 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 know that we have. Um, you know, real systemic racism um, across the United States. Um, and, and it is, uh, you know, we, we try to address um, these, dis these discipline disparities by, by reducing um, the overall rates of, of suspension, and that's great, um, but it doesn't actually reduce the disparities. And so um, we do need to make sure that we're applying uh, a racial analysis on top of, um, you know, trying to have race neutral solutions uh, to what it clearly ha it is a racial problem. Um, so we, we, could, we could treat each individual student better, uh, but then we also need to make sure that we, we bring a racial uh, lens to the work um, and, and try to make it better as well. I'm, I'm strongly supportive of the work that Chief Justice Beasley is doing with um, school justice partnerships and making sure that there are strong MOUs. We've had one in place for several years now, 
um, with both the Chapel Hill Police Department and the Carver Police Department to talk about the training that we expect out of our police departments um, and the roles that they have versus the roles that administrators maintain. Um, and we also have to train our administrators so they know um, that they're not supposed to call the police for every little discipline problem that exists. So um, I, there's, there's a lot of work to be done here. Um, it needs to be very intentional. Um, and we need candidate to be not, Baird, not afraid gonna, to talk about race. I'm going to stop you there. Thank you, Candidate Bear. Candidate Marr. Yeah, so I think that we, we start with making the, making the problem visible. I think that's part of the, the challenge we have in the state. That this, this is a, a moral failing on our part that, that we're losing uh, generations of kids because we're, we're pushing them out of school. They don't have opportunity. Uh, I, I think it was, uh, you know, one of the most poignant points James made was, was when we, we've got kids who are skipping school and then being suspended, and so they're out of school even more. Um, but, but the whole disparity issue is, is enormous, and, and so we do have to address it. So I think we, we absolutely have to start by um, looking at suspension rates by race and ethnicity, using that in our accountability metrics, uh, ensuring that uh, district leaders and building leaders have access to that data and they can see what's happening so that they, they can address it head on. Um, I think this is also one of our challenges with uh, professional development. We need to ensure that uh, we have adequate uh, professional development for entire buildings. And so that includes uh, not only teachers, but, but SROs and, and other folks who are, who are working with students on a daily basis. Um, so, so we can absolutely we can absolutely do that. So we need to identify the problem. We need to pro provide high quality PD. Uh, and then I think we also need to think about how do we make our schools uh, more reflective of the population. And so we've talked a little bit about how do we recruit and retain um, more teachers of color, and that has to be a priority for us. Um, so the, the best way to, uh, I think, perhaps address some of our uh, systemic racism that we have is um, is through representation, and, and so that matters a great deal. Thank you, Candidate Marr. Candidate Mangrum. Well, it, it isn't lost on me that I'm the only woman on this uh, program tonight, uh, and it's not lost to me that I'm a white woman in a field of teachers that are 80% white. And so I've looked a lot at my own um, practices, my own experiences, and how that plays out in a bigger picture in schools. Um, one of the things I've read about um, a lot is restorative justice. And it's not an authoritarian style of um, discipline, but it's a way to bring everyone together to the table, um, including the person who has, has caused the pain or inflicted um, an issue. I think that in order for us to come to a place where teachers um, are able to, uh, I think Creed uses the word objective versus subjective uh, um, offenses, but where they're able to understand what the child's doing, build those relationships with the child, and use a restorative practice that's going to require um, knowledge, it's going to require our own kind of racial equity training as teachers, it's going to require professional development, like I've mentioned at the Charlotte Hawkins Brown, where we can really focus on how to help um, students of color and what's going on, and it's going to require a statewide effort. Um, there are school systems that are doing this, but I really think as a state, we need to think about who are our teachers, how do we help them understand, like I'm trying to, my, my role, and then how that builds into a larger framework across the state so that we can help our students because definitely discipline is an issue that's keeping kids out of the classroom when they need to be in the classroom and being part of the part of the process themselves. Thank you, Candidate Mangrum. Candidate Sutton. So specifically uh, how we might address uh, the disproportionate suspensions, one looking at policy uh, uh, and while local districts and, and local boards uh, uh, set their own policies. Uh, the state superintendent, the Department of Public Construction, could work with the North Carolina School Boards Association uh, to adopt and provide a sample policy looking at reducing suspensions. Uh, what we've done in Wake County uh, is is taking our level one suspensions uh, and 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 uh, remove suspension as an alternative uh, for or, or, or discipline for level one offenses. So offenses such as uh, noncompliance disrespect, uh, we no longer 
uh, suspend for those. And so we would uh, work with districts to look at crafting policies that, that don't allow suspensions for low level uh, offenses. Uh, the second, uh, making sure that we've got appropriate uh, alternatives uh, and practices. Uh, you've heard already talk about uh, restorative justice uh, uh, practices, but also looking at uh, uh, having robust and meaningful uh, uh, in, in school uh, alternatives so that we're not suspending students and putting them out of the building uh, and onto the streets, making sure that we're keeping them in the classroom, in the, in the building, uh, but perhaps uh, in a, in a uh, contained classroom that has a uh, experienced teacher, professional teacher, that they're still continuing to get their lessons uh, um, and they're still learning. Uh, and then the last, uh, making sure that we're having appropriate uh, training, particularly around uh, implicit bias and making sure that uh, teachers and administrators uh, are going through implicit bias training uh, so that they understand uh, um, uh, how their, their own personal lens uh, might affect uh, uh, suspensions uh, and other choices around discipline. So those are the three things, policies, uh, looking at uh, training uh, and making sure that we got appropriate uh, uh, alternatives and uh, practices. Thank you. We'll now turn our attention to school choice. Um, research from Duke University and the North Carolina Justice Center suggests that charter schools contribute to the racial segregation of North Carolina's public schools. Additionally, a recent news story in the News and Observer published on February the 12th indicates that the United States Department of Education awarded North Carolina $36.6 million to increase the number of educationally disadvantaged students who attend charter schools, primarily because the majority of these schools only serve 18.8% economically disadvantaged students compared to traditional public schools that serve a significantly larger percentage of economically disadvantaged students. Given this context, what are your plans to support underfunded traditional public schools that many people argue would be a better strategy than redirecting funding to charter schools to make them more economically diverse. Our order for this will be candidate Sutton, candidate Barrett, candidate Marr, candidate Mangrum. Candidate Sutton, we will begin with you. I'm sorry, Dr. Graham, repeat the last part, of the question part of your statement again. Yes, the last part is given this context, what are your plans to support underfunded traditional public schools that many people argue would be a better strategy than redirecting funding to charter schools that force them to become more economically diverse? So I, I think my thought around that would be looking at uh, what we used to have, and I think we may have still in, in some small uh, um, measure, the, we used to call the DSSF fund, the Dis Disadvantaged Supplemental Student uh, Fund, but looking at how we might more robustly uh, uh, fund that, that was a, a line item that would help to uh, provide additional funding to uh, uh, um, more rural schools. Uh, and schools that weren't receiving proper funding. Uh, I think also looking at, uh, again, our rural uh, counties in tier one uh, and tier two districts, uh, again, and looking at formulas to provide additional funding. I think the state has a role to play uh, in making sure uh, that our, our uh, more economic distressed counties uh, have um, equitable or, or appropriate funding uh, in those counties uh, as well. So, I think the funding piece uh, is extremely uh, important uh, with regard to that. Uh, I do think, as I said earlier, that charters uh, uh, do serve to resegregate uh, our communities uh, and our schools. Uh, and so looking at um, the, the, the funding formula around that, but more importantly, looking at what the impact of charters are having, uh, charters are having on our LEAs uh, and being able to allow uh, LEAs to provide an impact statement during that charter application process uh, so that we've got a more balanced uh, approach or assessment in terms of what the impact will be uh, to a local community uh, when that new charter uh, is granted. Thank you. Candidate Baird? Yeah, I, 
I, I believe strongly in our North Carolina Constitution and its belief that public education um, is is absolute requirement for the success of our society um, and that it is available to each and every student across the state on a free and, and equitable basis. And so um, when I think about uh, about the existence of charter schools, um, I think there are some that are doing um, you know, reasonably good work um, to serve to serve all students, but there's an awful lot of them um, that are that are creating cookie cutter curriculum um, and not uh, and you know because they don't provide transportation or free and reduced lunch, um, they're really not accessible uh, to all students. I, I believe our strength um, is in our diversity and our strength of public schools um, is to create a uh, an integrated society. Um, I believe strongly if we're going to have choice programs and that's um, even within districts. Um, you know, they need to use uh, weighted lotteries, um, and, and I recognize we can't do that by race, uh, but we can do it by neighborhood, and we know that neighborhoods uh, correlate pretty directly to uh, socioeconomic factors, and including race today, uh, which is unfortunate in and of itself, but I, I don't get to set housing policy, um, but I can, um, you know, make sure that we're doing weighted lotteries um, and encouraging diverse schools um, at each and every point that we have. I, the, the superintendent um, is in charge of charter schools as well. And so I will use every lever and bully pulpit uh, that I have within that role to to encourage diversity um, and true inclusion uh, in our schools because because that is, um, that's why we exist. That's why we, 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 we take all students um, and that is uh, uh, deep in my soul um, as the reason we exist as public schools. Thank you. Candidate Moore. Yeah, so, so actually uh, on my website earlier today, marfornt.com, I um, released a video statement talking even more about, about charter schools and what I think we need to do. For, for me, I think this begins with uh, what we heard earlier about our funding effort. Uh, we need to add that $3.6 billion to get us to, at the minimum, the average funding effort. Um, you know. It, it would be even better if we got the funding effort of South Carolina. Uh, I think that is embarrassing for us as a state. Um, but what do we do specifically? Uh, it would be amazing if North Carolina became a, a state where we could take food out of the equation, where, where every child had access to, to meals. Uh, so that would help with access to, to schools. Uh, I think we also need to think about the transportation issue if we're going to, to truly be uh, address this segregation issue. Uh, I think the reality is we have 100,000 children in charter schools in the state. Uh, it's 10% of the population. Uh, to, to think that we're gonna do away with charter schools uh, just, just isn't, isn't a real policy position. Um, so we need to increase both the accountability and the transparency. Among the things I've talked about is beginning with an impact study. We need to have a good honest assessment of where char which charter schools are doing a good job and which are not. Uh, we need to think about how we can move from five-year renewals down to three-year renewals so that we can close underperforming charters and can hold them more accountable. Uh, we need to think about um, direct funding of charters from county commissioners so we add a layer of accountability. So now county commissioners can also be looking at the performance of charters within their, within their districts. So you've got the Department of Public Instruction and the State Board of Education holding them accountable. You have county commissioners holding them accountable. And, uh, and I think James is right as well. We need to be a little more thoughtful with the Charter School Advisory Board about who gets approved. Uh, we absolutely do not need uh, more of the same in terms of uh, kind of pedagogical approaches. We, we need to think differently about uh, how to best serve communities. Weighted lottery is absolutely another example where, where we need to um, address some of these issues. Thank you. Candidate Mangrum. So I think we need to communicate um, to people that privatization is an agenda item that has hijacked our charter schools. They are no longer around the original intent that they were. Um, a lot of people don't understand what charter schools are and how they impact the larger um, state. They do resegregate our schools, um, which is really a shame. I know Charlotte went from being at one point integrated and known nationally to being the most segregated town and um, uh, or school district and charters have a lot to do with that. Uh, second, we need to start thinking about 
why do we have public schools? We have them for the greater good. Um, I often hear people say when they talk about charter schools, I have to do what's best for my child. I get that, I have two children, but I also want us to start thinking about the greater good. Public schools were meant to help us create good citizens and society, so public schools are important. So what I heard you ask was then, how do we put more funding in public schools? Um, one of the interesting things I saw was in Guilford County, there was uh, someone wanted to do a KIPP school. His name's Mr. Ellison. Uh, he went to the superintendent, said, I wanna start a charter school like, like KIPP. Um, he said, look, let's look at how we can do that in our traditional schools, and they did. They created it in a traditional public school setting under the district, so there's no one making money, there's no profit being made, um, they have to provide transportation, food, etc. cetera. Uh, then I know there's a fantastic um, charter school in Wilmington called GLOW, and it's for African-American females, it's around leadership, um, and they don't want it to close. I get that. So why don't we move it into the public system? Um, again, to me, that's kind of like becoming a magnet. But the point is we want students to have choice, but they have to be choices that help the greater good. And they can't starve our public schools and they can't segregate our schools. Um, and they have to be held to the same accountability and transparency. Um, there are some really sad stories of corruption, of schools closing down at night. Um, I am absolutely, uh, about taking good high quality charter schools when we find them and then moving them unto, under our system so that we can have some, um, so we can have some direction with them. Thank you, candidate Makram. Mr. Bass, I'm gonna turn it over to you. You get the final question that we'll try to squeeze in tonight. Thank you. No. Perfect time for me to hit unmute. Uh, the final question is around teacher preparation and teacher diversity. The state of North Carolina has 47 teacher education programs at our public and private institutions of higher education. 15 teacher preparation programs at our state supported public institutions and 32 teacher preparation programs at our independent institutions. There are some people who argue that our universities and colleges are not adequately preparing classroom teachers for culturally and linguistically diverse students whom our teachers must engage on a daily basis in our pre-K through 12 schools. From your vantage point, what are some reforms that these programs need to make to produce a larger and more diverse supply of high quality teachers? This round of question will start with candidate Marr, then candidate Mangrum, then candidate Sutton, then candidate Barrett. Candidate Marr. Yeah, I think it's important to remind folks that are, that are listening in that North Carolina universities, public and private, prepare the most effective teachers in North Carolina. So our beginning teachers who graduate from our colleges and schools of education across the state are the most effective, yet they only prepare about a third of all of our new teachers. Two thirds of our teachers come from other sources. Another third come from out of state and the final third are lateral entry. So whenever we talk about teacher effectiveness, particularly with beginning teachers, and we attribute that all to the, to the educator preparation programs inside of North Carolina, it's not always fair. Now I say that, but I'm also gonna say that in my work at NC State, we routinely collected data uh, from our graduates and they would talk about uh, we would ask them the areas in which they needed more support, and they would routinely talk about the, the very issues you're, you're bringing up, right? Uh, their ability to work with diverse students, uh, their ability to implement cultural relevant pedagogy, or uh, working with students with special needs. So I, I think we're going to continually have to address that as an issue within the teacher preparation community. Um, you know, at the same time in which we have begun to, or, or we continued to defund our public So part of this gets back again to funding. So we have to, to, to stop cutting the funding for, for university states. Our colleges of education are starving. Uh, and then we're putting a lot on back of them to try and recruit more individuals into the programs with limited resources, low salaries, high uh, low morale, uh, difficult working conditions. So, so I think as those the K-12 environment, if we can continue to make positive steps 
in K-12, and we more individuals into the fashion. We can restore some funding to our particularly our publicly funded institutions. We can figure out the use. Thank you. Candidate Mangrum. Uh, can you understand me? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so one of the best ways to do that is to recruit more teachers of color. And one of my suggestions is having a strong statewide um, high school cadet program so that we can get kids in schools earlier um, and realize how rewarding that, that can be. Um, also looking at community colleges and having discussions about uh, what it means to be a teacher, to have experiences as being a teacher. Um, but the earlier we catch kids, the, the, the better. Um, I, I think that something that's really important is earlier someone was talking about effective teachers and HR and things like that. Um, if schools of education know what makes an effective teacher. Um, we have the data, we have the research, uh, we help form the um, rubrics to score that. So the person who sits in this office needs to know what makes an effective teacher and how to recruit people to it. You have to be an ambassador. You can't say, I want you to be effective. You have to say, this is what being effective looks like. I can show you what being a master teacher looks like. Um, I think by going into HBCUs, by starting high school cadet programs, by um, having universities talk to one another in this Institute of Professional Development that I wanna create. Um, I think there are multiple ways that we can raise the bar that education is what people should strive to be um, because we make the biggest impact on people's lives and teachers have the most um, in school impact on a child's success. Um, the best way again is to do that is to get teachers of color because the more teachers of color we have, the better the students will do. We, we have research to prove that as well. So again, in order to, um, for schools of ed to be more effective, we need to do better at recruiting, and there are lots of ways the state can help that. And we have to have someone in this office who understands what it means to be a teacher um, and can be an ambassador for that. Thank you very much. Candidate Sutton. So in terms of um, what reforms uh, I would consider one, I think, more meaningful uh, partnerships with uh, K-12, uh, and so that uh, our local superintendents, uh, again, HR professionals, teachers are working with our schools of education uh, so that they are, are aware and sharing across with each other, collaborating around what that 21st century teacher looks like, what's needed in the classroom, what are we seeing uh, on the ground level, uh, and communicating that to uh, uh, our schools of ed uh, so that we are uh, training our teachers uh, uh, on the on, on the cutting edge things that are needed, cutting edge practices and approaches. Uh, I think the second, more clinical uh, opportunities um, uh, for teachers, uh, perhaps that we're starting uh, a student teaching uh, opportunities earlier uh, than or waiting, uh, not waiting until uh, their final year, but perhaps providing uh, uh, clinical opportunities uh, sooner. Uh, and then a third reform uh, I will look at uh, would be, um, and we see this uh, similar partnership already happening uh, uh, in Bertie County, uh, Elizabeth City, and around Elizabeth City State University, looking at teacher residencies, uh, very similar to uh, what we see in the medical profession, uh, where you have a, um, a residency where teachers are uh, in, in the building, in, in the classrooms, uh, and, and have a residency type of um, setup uh, where again we're, we're getting that mentoring, uh, the training, uh, the one-on-one the, the -on -one, uh, experience being provided uh, with those uh, clinicians that, that know uh, again how to create uh, the master teacher. Thank you very much. Candidate Barrett. Yeah, so this is an area that um, I'm humble enough to know that I'm not an expert in. I've learned an awful lot from um, particularly Dr. Marr and, and his experience in um, being on the Standards Commission, and, and we have had great conversations on the campaign trail about, about some of this. Um, but I do know that one of my um, non-negotiables here uh, is that we need to make sure that our teachers are prepared, uh, particularly to, to teach literacy, 
um, and to teach literacy in a way that we know works for all students. Um, our, our rates of literacy um, are, are bad for everybody at the moment, um, but they're particularly bad for our students of color. Um, and that is, uh, that's really, really not acceptable to me. Um, and we need to make sure that our teachers are being prepared um, in such a way that, that they actually use the science of reading um, and make sure that they're, uh, they're actually teaching the way that we know now that the brain learns um, and, and not using methods that, that actually create poor readers. Because we know it when we use methods that, that, that actually don't work, um, we know what the results are because those are the results we're getting today um, where, where half of our students or, or two thirds of our students of color are not, um, are, are not proficient in reading. And so um, we need to be much better at that. And, um, and quite honestly, we need to have the, have the Department of Public Instruction and the State Board of Education um, kind of do some remediation here uh, to make sure that we're fully prepared um, to reach out and be able to teach each and every student um, how to read because places that are focusing on this like Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, like Mississippi um, are seeing much better results than we are um, and, and we, need to, we need to get to the point uh, where all students are able to read um, and, and that's, uh, uh, that's, what we, that's what we owe all of our students um, across the state of North Carolina. Thank you very much candidates. Dr. Graham, that's my final question. Thank you, Mr. Bass. We are at the end of our question period, so what we're going to do at this point is give each candidate one minute to give us closing remarks. Why should we cast our vote for you for the state superintendent position in the state of North Carolina? We'll uh, end the same way that we began. Candidate Barrett, you'll go first, then candidate Marr, then candidate Mangrum, then candidate Sutton. Candidate Barrett, one minute. Thank you so much. We, we know that this, um, that this work, the teaching, um, is all about relationships that, that we have with each and every student. Um, I also believe that we need to be modeling at the, at the adult level uh, for, right, good relationships between the state superintendent, um, the state board, uh, and the General Assembly, um, and all the local superintendents as well. Um, I have a career of, of providing leadership um, that is focused on relationship building. Um, I know how to get things done, how to drive systemic change um, that we need to see in our schools. Uh, I also know how to use the levers of policy, uh, particularly for the benefit of our teachers, um, and providing them respect because the respect is not just about pay, uh, but it's also about providing creative policies that um, that meet the needs of all student of all teachers. Um, and then advocacy um, has got to be part of this work. Um, and I have more. Uh, training in community organizing and advocacy than any other candidate here. So I, I, I ask for your vote, James Barrett, on March 3rd. Thank you. Thank you, Candidate Barrett. Candidate Moore. I want to start just by saying thank you for the opportunity tonight. Uh, I think it's fantastic. We, we have candidates who are committed to equity for our schools, uh, and whoever wins this race, you can now hold them to that commitment. I think that is important. I've argued for a couple months now that the state superintendent needs to be someone with experience, expertise, and vision. You should have ex broad experiences in public education. I, I was a high school teacher. I was a professor at a historically black college. I was an administrator at a large public university. And I've worked in advocacy and I've worked in policy. I believe those are the kinds of experiences that one should have. You should have expertise in this work as well. And I've demonstrated that expertise. And in order to fulfill the obligations we see in the Leandra report, you need someone with vision who can bring individuals together. And so I think that's part of what we have to think about in the next superintendent. Who's the individual who can lead this work? Who is the individual who works across party lines? Who's the individual who can be a collaborator? And so I ask for your vote on March 3rd. Michael Moore, thank you very much. Thank you, Candidate Moore. Candidate Mangrum. Yes, um, I heard a candidate talk about teaching reading. I taught reading and I taught teachers how to teach reading and I understand the, um, the national panels report on reading. I heard someone talk about moving students into uh, college students in the classroom sooner. Our interns are in their two years of their program and I supervise them during that. I'm in the classroom with them. What we need is someone, as Michael said, with expertise, who knows what it means to be a teacher, who knows the nuances, who has the expertise, skills, and knowledge to understand teaching. 
They also need to have a vision. So I brought about the, I wanted to talk about the first thousand days. I talked about uh, Office of Equity Affairs. I talked about um, different programs and policies that will bring new life to education. I can be an ambassador for that. Um, and then finally, we have to have someone who's electable because we have got to beat um, the Republicans because the Democrats believe that public schools are important. Um, of these four people, we are all Democrats. We need someone who can win. I believe that I have um, the firmest voice. I'm a teacher's champion. I'm a child's champion. I know what it means. I'll have to stop you there, candidate Mangrum. All right, vote for me, Jen Mangrum, Frenzy.com. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Sutton. Yes, yeah, so I've talked about my professional experience, uh, but in thinking about uh, uh, this role, leadership matters uh, and experience of political, lead uh, political uh, leadership matters. Uh, I've led the state's uh, largest school system, uh, Wake County, uh, been on that board for the last 10 years, uh, served as chair, currently served as chair, also served as chair in 2013, uh, and I've served as vice chair of that board in 2012 uh, and 2019. Uh, and we have seen uh, over the last three years uh, what inexperienced leadership looks like uh, at the helm of the Department of Public Construction uh, and leading K-12 public education uh, in North Carolina. And we cannot afford another four years uh, of on-the-job training uh, as our next state superintendent. And so I think it's important that we have someone that has uh, that experience in leading a large educational institution uh, such as DPI, uh, someone who knows how to champion uh, uh, public education, who knows how to support our teachers, but who knows also how to support uh, our, our support personnel, uh, our bus drivers, our teacher assistants, our custodians, our yeah. cafeteria workers. Candidate Sutton now has to stop you there. Your one minute is up. Thank you. Thank you. Candidates, we thank you again for joining us tonight. Our time passed by very quickly. Mr. Bass and I probably had about five more questions we could have posed to you. So we hope that you will visit us in Winston-Salem, make time to come back and engage us in additional conversation. But we thank you again for your flexibility for tonight, uh, given the inclement weather. So again, thank you, candidate Barrett. Thank you, candidate Marr. Thank you, candidate Mangrum. Thank you, candidate Sutton. We truly appreciate your time this evening. And we wish each of you well in your bid for the North Carolina State Superintendent of Public Instruction. At this time, I will turn the program back over to Reverend Ford, who will close us out. Thank you once again. Dr. Graham, Mr. Bass, thank you so much for such a great job in moderating this forum. And just to echo uh, Dr. Graham's sentiments, thank you to all of you candidates who joined us for what I think was a very rich and robust discussion. I think whatever happens, we're going to be in good hands, given all of the, the great ideas that we heard here in this conversation tonight. I do want to report, we're very excited. We had a pretty steady uh, 65 participants uh, in this Zoom call today uh, throughout the state. And so we're very happy about the level of participation, particularly given the kind of last minute shifts that we had um, to make here. We're going to ask uh, Sarah Montgomery from the North Carolina Justice Center to very briefly uh, give us a few thoughts on next steps. Then we will formally close out this call. We do want to remind folks that this call is and has been recorded. Uh, so we'll be looking to make that available at the appropriate time. And thank Kelly P. Easton, our fair and fearless leader of Action for Equity, really shepherding into this vision as we move that organization, as well as all of the partners who joined with us to make this happen. So Sarah, I'm gonna give you just a couple of minutes to share some next steps, if you will. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes, I can. Um, I just want to um, echo um, the, uh, just applaud everybody. That was such a meaningful conversation, excellent moderation. And I really appreciate the intention of focusing this conversation tonight um, on equity and um, appreciate the great leadership of our friends at Action for Equity. Um, for folks who are interested in um, how they can connect to some advocacy efforts and influence and change or use use the West Ed report and this next phase of Leandro to help support and advance their own um, advocacy. I just wanted to touch briefly um, on some work we're doing. 
Um, I am Sarah Montgomery. I work with Chris at the Justice Center's um, Education and Law Project. And for the last couple of months, um, since last fall, we've been working to coordinate a community response um, to Wested's report and to this next phase of Leandro, specifically focusing on um, lifting up and identifying the needs of um, children and underserved community groups. So we have leaders who have been needing um, either working directly with or supporting um, student groups like students affected by uh, racial discrimination, English learners, um, folks in the early childhood education space, uh, students from rural counties, students from low income uh, communities, um, students with disabilities. We really think it's absolutely vital that um, in looking to shape policy and looking to advocate for change and to really utilize the West Ed Report as this fantastic roadmap um, we really need to highlight the priorities and the policies that will most um, impact um, cha beneficial changes and positive changes for those student groups. Many of our leaders are with us tonight. We've got um, leaders from Education Justice Alliance, uh, the Pastors for um, Children North Carolina, Education Without Barriers, uh, Save Our Schools, the Black Alliance, among others. Um, and we are going to be working with um, local advocates and leaders connected um, through uh, Action for Equity. Um, coming up in March, we're going to be working alongside um, the Pastors for Children, uh, Ministers Conference of Winston-Salem and Vicinity for our Part 1 planning meeting, which is going to be in March. Um, and then again in April, we're going to be with Faith in the City for our second part. Um, and I'll also mention we're going to be um, focusing some um, really uh, important community engagement conversations, um, specifically out in Eastern communities, working in partnership with uh, Marcus Bass and the Black Alliance, our friends at Advanced Carolina, um, through a very strategic um, and representative of diverse voices um, in focus groups in a couple different communities. So if, if there's um, folks on the line who are in uh, the Triangle area or in different regions of the state, um, and you want more information about connecting with this uh, community-led statewide coalition, you can reach out to me directly. Um, it's Sarah, S-A-R-A-H-M, at ncjustice.org. And for our um, Winston-Salem and Forsyth County and Piedmont regional folks, you can connect with uh, Kelly um, at Action for Equity to get more information as well. Um, so I appreciate the, the time and the intention tonight, and I'm also very grateful that none of us have to uh, drive um, in the storm. So thanks again for having me. All right, brothers and sisters, with that, we're going to bring uh, this forum to a close. We thank everyone uh, for joining and being a part of this conversation tonight. I would reiterate again, Dr. Graham's best wishes to all of you candidates uh, who are part of this forum uh, this evening. I want to pray all God's blessings upon each and every one of you. Have a wonderful evening, and we will be in touch. Thank you. Good night. Thanks. Good night. Thank you.